a it's good to see you, James and Mike. I can't Welcome. hear you. Oh, yep. There's the audio. Yeah. Oh, good. To, good to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. There's Charlene joining. Yeah. So um, we're just uh, getting started. So good to see you, Charlene. Welcome. And uh, so this is Heart of Freedom Meditation. I'm Doug Pollan. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to come together to practice this evening. So as we um, settle in, i um, like to just invite us to reflect on welcoming, uh, welcoming ourselves, welcoming each other uh, into the practice of being present. And um, this practice is really about welcoming. Um, it's important for us to welcome all people uh, in the spirit of generosity and openness. So we open all people of every age, ethnicity, cultural background, religious background, socioeconomic ability, ability sexual orientation, gender identity. So try to aspire to, aspire to follow the footsteps of the Buddha who offer the teachings freely, openly. So um, doing, the, doing the same thing here 2,600 years later, um, offering this practice. So uh, Harrison, welcome, good to see you. And um, so as we get settled in, um, perhaps um, it's helpful to just let eyes closed or be softly downcast. And taking a couple of uh, long, slow, deep breaths, just uh, Focusing on letting the lungs and the diaphragm and the belly really relax and um, expand. And then really fully exhale a couple of times. and to gently check in with this um, sitting form and see if um, there's any postural uh, changes that could lead to sitting in a posture that's a little more alert, a little more supportive of presence. Sometimes there's um, scrunching or slouching that happens kind of without conscious awareness. So we can bring a little bit more conscious attention to our posture. And once we're in the alert, kind of balanced posture, then to really just let the muscles and organs of the body relax within that upright structure, the rib cage and the spinal column and everything holds us. We don't, the muscles don't need to work extra. So just letting things soften. Softening the muscles of the face particularly around the eyes and loosening the jaw and feeling your feet. Perhaps they're flat on the ground or touching the ground. And sensing into the um, relative um, kind of weight of the body as experienced through pressure or contact, noticing that those points of contact. Yeah. 
Yeah. So a sense of being connected to the experience of sitting to this body that sits. And to take um, refuge in our direct experience, this capacity to be awake, this inner capacity to know the truth, this capacity to know um, that we practice in community, in supportive community. So in this way, directly from our own experience, from our own discovery, we can be curious about how we take refuge. What does it mean to take refuge in uh, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha? How is that a real experience? How can we connect with that? And it's in um, accepting the invitation uh, that the experience of this breath offers, these sensations of breathing, that we're invited into this uh, deep investigation, starting with uh, calming and bringing ease and perhaps some concentration to um, relinquish any um, grasping or resisting, um, particularly as it pertains to the experience of the breath, just letting the breath be natural. And in this um, staying present with the sensations of breathing as best we can, uh, it's perhaps noticing the quality of the breath, whether it's shallow or deep, without judging or trying to fix the breath or trying to change anything. It's just noticing in this moment, the breath is like this. And it's an invitation to step out of identification with concepts and ideas, with commentary and judgment, and to step into the direct experience of life in this moment. So that could be as simple as noticing whether the breath is an inhale or an exhale, 
how does that register as sensation? So where is it that we notice the sensations of breath in the body? If it's um, difficult to uh, find those sensations of breathing, um, please be kind and um, friendly with yourself, maybe placing a hand on the chest or the belly, if that's helpful. Or you could do a simple silent noting practice in your mind with the in-breath just silently noting in with the out breath out. Just noticing uh, is there's a stronger sensation registering in perhaps the belly or the chest or the tip of the nostrils. And to try to stay curious about the those sensations like so where is that showing up? Being attentive to the sensations of breathing, like you'd attend to or lean into a conversation with a good friend. with uh, out uh, judgment or commentary uh, just noticing if there's uh, something that pulls our focus away from the breath and into being lost in thinking um, and just coming back to this breath coming back to the most predominant sensation maybe it's more in the belly or the chest, or the nose. And if, if we're feeling it more in the belly or the chest, then maybe just noticing the rhythm. Is the inhalation longer or shorter than the exhalation? And if there's a pause between the exhalation and the inhalation, how long is that pause? Can we 
be present for that. So this is an invitation to stay present and curious about the most predominant sensations associated with breathing. And each breath is um, different, subtly or perhaps more pronounced. Uh, the oxygen is fresh as this moment. So we can notice how far deep under the skin we can feel the sensations of movement of the breath. And is there any sensation around the tip of the nostrils? And if so, how far within the nostrils do we experience the sensation of the breath coming and going? If our most predominant sensations are in the chest or the belly, yeah, to notice how far the expansion and contraction is. That proprioceptive sense inside the body of movement, of respiration coming and going, having a sense of how oh, it's constantly in flux.
sometimes um, when um, there's a departure from presence with breathing, it's because there's a habitual reaction to something that's perceived as unpleasant or pleasant. There's a resisting or there's a clinging. And in this practice, um, the alternative to getting kind of sucked in to the habitual resisting the unpleasant and clinging to the pleasant is to be curious about what's going on. To actually step back from the habitual conditioning to notice what's happening actually. To recognize unpleasant as unpleasant or pleasant as pleasant, the feeling tone helps us to free ourselves from that habit energy and maybe recenter in the breath. It's coming back to this breath, this moment. So um, anytime there's any kind of what we might think of as a distraction, um, we come back to the sensation of breathing without judgment. This is um, an incredibly gentle, non-coercive practice. There's no forcing anything. There's just this um, invitation to remember our intention to be present. And if there is a sense of um, continuity to some extent with the breath coming and going, staying with those sensations, then there can be a deeper sense of ease and relaxation um, as we let everything be everything rising and passing away without clinging or resisting. And it all comes from noticing what we can notice in our bellies, our chests, nostrils, the sense of caring and curiosity for what we feel, what we can feel, now and now 
and now. There is always and only this moment, this experience. So this practice of curiosity, of investigation, is at the direct experiential level, starting with the body, starting right here. There's always this moment to start again, this breath, these body sensations, this invitation to go deeper. And uh, if there is a sense of ease and continuity with breathing, um, then you're welcome, of course, to expand your awareness. Um, if breath still is challenging or difficult, trying to stay with that in a gentle, patient, persistent, practice, just patiently coming back. It doesn't matter how many times the mind wanders. This is a practice where there is no point of no return. There's always this moment, this breath. And if you'd like to let your awareness expand, could do like a brief survey of others' sensations. What can you actually feel in this moment? What do you actually know beyond sensations of breathing? What is there here to directly investigate within the realm of body sensations. That could include arms and perhaps legs, hands, feet. And what can we actually feel viscerally? taking the same quality of caring and curiosity to this exploration present with embodied experience. And there's always the breath to come back to. There's always this experience of in-breathing and out-breathing. We feel ourselves getting lost or pulled off into tangential thinking, planning, commentary, judging, 
It's wonderful to just notice that as thinking, not get caught up in the content. Just notice it, thinking there it is. It's changing just like everything else. And it's just a stream of um, electrical signals in the brain. And there's also right here, these sensations in the body. So giving ourselves the same level of caring and curiosity for our bodies, for whatever sensations we notice. As this um, meditation comes to a close, um, we can still choose to maintain our presence and curiosity as we transition into the rest of the evening. So that could be just simply noticing that what's the most predominant sensation from moment to moment, or to notice the posture of the body or the feeling tone or just being present with sound. Yeah, so those are just some, some examples, some invitations. So uh, to stay present with the body and maybe there's um, an impulse or desire to move or stretch and so to mindfully stay with that and um, 
yeah, curious about it. Maybe not doing immediately, but just noticing that impulse and then the intention and then staying with the sensation. Yeah, so you can, can play with that. Take that as an invitation. Yeah, and please let's also be really kind with ourselves and uh, gentle. Um, there's, there can easily be moments of forgetting and getting kind of pulled in. And um, this is a place to remember that, um, like I was saying during the guided meditation, there's, there's, in this practice, there isn't any point of no return. There's always um, the blessings of this moment that we can come back and be present and take refuge in. So giving ourselves that blessing, holding space for each other for that blessing, um, offering that. Yeah, so that's the invitation. Um, and um, so uh, in just a moment, I'd like to share just a couple of reminders and uh, announcements. And um, so first is um, next Thursday, the 20th of June, I'm gonna be offering Heart of Freedom both in person and on Zoom. So we'll be meeting up like we did um, on the third Thursday back in May over at um, PIMC. So you're welcome to join me there in person if you're able to do that. Uh, and we'll still be here on Zoom as well. So hope one way or the other you're able to join up next week. Uh, and um, let's see, uh, I guess that's a little too much to post at once. Uh, I was going to post in the chat. Let's see. I'm going to take that part out. Okay, so we'll post that. And then we'll post this. See if that works. It'll work. Okay. So there is a limit on how much you can post in this chat. So um, just a reminder about the practice of generosity. It's really, I think of it as a invitation to um, experiencing the joy of giving um, and um, it's an incredible thing um, to live in the spirit of generosity so um, at some point I'll circle back and do a Dharma talk on that um, but yeah there it is there's a little bird and the thing about next Thursday and then also just to mention some upcoming um, practice options through PIMC um, coming up on this Saturday, June 15th from 9 to 11. Um, there's a, a garden club meeting at PIMC to freshen up the yards and gardens and sidewalks. So um, no registration required, um, but it could be a lot of fun in the spirit of giving. And then on the 22nd of June, from 10 to 4, Candle Summers and uh, Phyllis Moses are offering their uh, seasonal uh, summer solstice meditation and sound healing. So, wonderful opportunity to meditate with sound. And then there's a retreat that Robert is offering up in Canada. July 15th to the 24th, reservation only. You can go to the website. And then Jim Dalton is offering Qigong uh, retreat on uh, in person at PMC on July 20th. So there you go. And I uh, didn't mention in talking about the Thursday evening next week, but it's actually happening on solstice 
uh, the summer solstice, so we'll be doing uh, a uh, practice to honor that and to practice mudita, altruistic joy, the practice of cultivating joy. So there's that. Um, so I'd like to give us a chance to do a brief check-in, if you'd like to share, totally optional. Um, but I am curious to know what's on your hearts and minds, what's most alive for you this evening. And so in that practice, an invitation to say our names, first names, uh, and then um, just a few words, and then when you're finished, to say I've spoken. And then that would let the next person who might want to take a turn to know that they could, they could jump in. And um, so I'll start this evening. Um, I first my name is Doug, and I heard a wonderful story about um, death and dying with generosity today. Um, a friend of mine's um, parent passed, his father died, and um, he was um, incredibly generous to the folks that worked at the assisted living. And um, they, um, they were so um, grateful for his kindness and generosity, they all clocked out for 15 minutes to go be at his bedside. Um, pretty incredible. So it's, um, I mean, it's, it was a beautiful death. I it just brought tears to my eyes hearing his description. So I have spoken. Thank you. This is Charlene, and I just wanted to say that during that meditation we just did, I was so, so quiet and so present for most of it, that at the end I realized that I felt like I could feel my heartbeat, like my pulse. And then I got curious, like, where can I feel that, you know, and I could feel it like in my chest where my heart is, but I could also feel it like in my wrists and my hands. I could just kind of feel my heartbeat through my body. It was it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know when I really tuned into that. Um, I guess sometimes when we're, you know, like when we're upset or, or fearful or something like that, we can feel it, but to be so calm and to feel my pulse in my heart, that was, that was kind of interesting. I have spoken. Thanks, Charlene. Um, I'm thankful for several things um, today and, and more recently. Um, one, but one kind of um, little one um, that I've been encountering most days is um, so I, I recently uh, changed jobs, which has been very good. Um, I'm thankful for that. Um, only downside is my commute is a, a little worse, and I um, get to drive in a busy section near downtown um, every morning, which uh, 
can be pretty aggravating for, you know, maybe 10 years, usually when I'm in that uh, section, I, I can kind of feel my blood pressure go up and often I can feel my pulse and I know that I am kind of getting in a more reactive state that's not helpful for me and probably, you know, doesn't make me, uh, uh, it's a spot that's, you know, people don't act very well, kind of brings out the worst in people and it's definitely done that to me for several years. Um, so now that's part of my daily commute. Um, and after the first few days of that and feeling that tension rise, I realized I, you know, I can't, I can't do this, um, every day, uh, sustainably. So I'm not a hundred percent successful at it, but it's become a nice, um, very conscious spot of being able to practice, um, and just being very deliberate about noticing when frustration is rising, trying to take the opportunity to um, pay attention to that and also pay attention to, you know, the, right now it's, it's a very beautiful stretch. There are trees and, and grass and they're lit up in the morning sunlight. And uh, it's just, I, I'm just very thankful that I've been able to make that adjustment um and doug i know you you've talked previously about driving a, as an example which has always resonated with me a lot in part because of this little section so i, I appreciate that and mm -hmm. i have spoken thank you thank you sir Who's good? Just to um, check and see if anybody is just on the cusp of jumping in there. Okay. Well, um, so my Dharma reflection, Dharma talk this evening is on curiosity or um, investigation. And um, Actually, your sharing, Harrison, reminded me of a little tangentially of a story um, that I could share about curiosity and how our um, tendency um, is um, for to think we know what's happening, um, and sometimes we really don't know what's happening. So a few, a few years ago, I was driving down a street, a side street. It was a, like a quiet side street. And I saw a man standing next to a car. And he was gesticulating wildly to a woman driver who was sitting in the car with her window down. And um, I noticed an assumption passing through the mind that this man was being aggressive in some way towards her, towering over her, using his gestures to intimidate her, perhaps even preventing her from driving off. Um, and as I slowed down to see if she needed any help, I suddenly realized that they were both talking in sign language and the conversation was animated, but perfectly friendly. Uh, and if I wasn't paying um, attention, I could have completely misconstrued what was going on. Uh, and 
um, there was a little bit of embarrassment that came up and then um, a little chuckling and recognition, oh, thank goodness for mindfulness. Thank goodness for slowing down and really paying attention. And so mindfulness is about sometimes slowing down enough to notice what's really going on rather than jumping to conclusions. Um, we can easily make assumptions, sometimes outrageous assumptions, um, in dealing with others and also a lot of times, maybe even more often, dealing with ourselves. Um, when things don't go well, um, there might be a ready tendency to jump to the conclusion, I'm a failure. Um, everyone else manages to be happy all the time except for me. Um, most people probably take 20 or 30 minutes to put together an Ikea kitchen. But for me, uh, three hours later, it's like I haven't even started. Um, and when it comes to home repair stuff, I tend to be willing to do almost anything. But it usually takes me three or four times longer than it would take somebody who knew what they were doing. So I have to be patient with myself. Um, and I'd like to just invite you to reflect on and remember um, how it can be delightful to have a conversation with someone who's genuinely curious about you, who loves to hear about your job or your recent holiday, your hobbies, your children. Um, it's one of the most precious gifts we can offer to another human being. And, um, and so in this practice, we're really um, offering it to ourselves as well. Um, and, you know, when we're curious about another person as a human being, as a whole, human being with um, a recognition of their total humanness, it starts to um, transcend the, the things that we, um, the preconceived notions and conditionings that separate us. Um, yeah. So with this practice, um, the practice of mental uh, and heart cultivation, even in times of great turbulence and change, it's, fall, it's possible to find stability and calm in the center of the storm. Um, and in this practice, uh, we um, we cultivate um, the um, potentiality to recover from reactivity and to see more clearly what's happening in us and around us, both uh, in formal meditation and in the rest of life. And um, I really value the simplicity of being curious. Um, and to kind of hold in abeyance um, that part of me that thinks it should know everything, that wants to jump to conclusions, to understand that that's, there's a part that wants to be in control. There's a part that wants to be able to anticipate or identify. And by being curious, um, I'm actually holding out this the space for new possibilities. By being curious, I mean actively engaging with kind of innate enthusiasm for wonder, discovery, learning. Um, and it includes seeing and appreciating the magic and the miracles that continually surround us. Um, 
just, I mean, I don't know if, if you've had the opportunity to be around a young child recently who engages with her surroundings and just absorbs the life around them and discovering more about themselves and the world. Um, yeah, this process of curiosity is, is kind of like that, really. And um, it isn't something that um, needs to be relegated to the young. Um, here's a poem from Mary Oliver. It's called When Death Comes. When death comes, like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes, and takes all of the right coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measles pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like that cottage of darkness? And therefore I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood and a personhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to this earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. So um, this cultivation of curiosity uh, requires self-awareness, noticing what is happening in any given moment. And it involves letting go of fixed ideas and opening up to new possibilities and understandings about ourselves and the nature of existence. Um, and uh, it's pretty easy with some practice to be curious about the aspects of life that inspire us and bring us joy and ignite our passions. But in this practice, it's also an invitation to be curious about the things that apparently cause pain or discomfort, um, the things that are difficult to bear. So, for example, when anger comes, can I notice what happens in my body? What are the triggers? Is there any kind of root cause underlying the angry feeling? Um, our views of the world can become kind of static. The per perspectives we hold are influenced by a variety of filters that we three, we see through, um, and these develop over time as a result of our social conditioning and previous experiences. And it's this quality of mindful presence. Um, when we recognize these filters and see through them with a new perspective, um, so one example, um, I work as a therapist and hear lots of different life stories um, is an example of someone whose father left when they were young 
and now usually subconsciously they expect that all of the men in their lives that are important to them will abandon them. Um, and this may be um, a real experience for them, though it is not necessarily true, but there's that experience. And so with, with uh, self-compassion and kindness and awareness, we start to um, hold a question. Is that true? That assumption? Um, so theory, curiosity invites us to think outside the box and to challenge our habitual ways of thinking. Um, and when we become curious about something, it encourages us to let go of our certainty and absolutes and be open to maybe new possibilities. Um, in this example of the person who expected to be abandoned by men, becoming curious opens to the possibilities that perhaps some men do stay. Uh, and even if they do leave, that's okay. Um, and um, we can look for alternatives uh, to currently held beliefs to open up new possibilities. Um, so, um, to some extent, we create what we expect in the world. So, by letting go of expectations and becoming more open, we allow new possibilities to emerge. Um, and to um, be um, responsive to the actual conditions that we find ourselves in. Um, and so um, I find it incredibly useful when I find myself getting caught up, obsessing or um, being yeah, emotionally kind of stuck to ask the question, so what is it that I'm believing? What is the mind believing? Um, what is it that is asking for acceptance or understanding? Um, where does this show up in the body? What are the body sensations? What are the thoughts that are being believed? These are all invitations to curiosity, to go deeper. Um, so being curious about the situations we find ourselves in helps us to remove any extra energy from the situation. And it means that we don't need to change it or fix it or blame something or someone else. Um, so from this perspective, there aren't really um, mistakes so much as opportunities to learn and grow. And the invitation is to accept things more fully as they are, explore um, the conditions that make the the circumstances what they are and um, so um, it encourages acceptance through not a blind acceptance but rather an acceptance that this is how things are along with a curiosity as to what the next steps are that we can take um, that might help us change the outcome in the future so a lot of times we think of acceptance as kind of giving in or capitulation or um, being kind of defeated. But this is actually an energetic um, learning opportunity to bring curiosity. Um, yeah. And so mindfulness helps us to do that. And um, 
there's a kind of, as practice deepens, there starts to be more of a continual process of inquiry that encourages us to live our lives, to live our truth, and to find increasing joy and freedom. Instead of getting caught up in resisting, we, are, we see challenges as opportunities. What can I learn from this? How can I be curious about that? Here's a quote from, um, oh, let me just, oh, actually, this is a, this is a poem from Rilke. Have a patience with everything that remains unsolved in your heart. Try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms, and like books written in a foreign language. Do not now look for the answers. They cannot now be given to you because you could not live them. It is a question of experiencing everything. At present, you need to live the question. Perhaps you will gradually, without even noticing it, find yourself experiencing the answer some distant day. So we get to live the question, hang out in the question, in the mystery. There is a phrase, constant conscious choice in relationship to how we meet situations and choices that arise in our lives. Make, making constant conscious choices encourages us to remain aware and watchful. Um, I sometimes refer to those in, in their nascent form as micro choice points, um, where we can, instead of um, letting our habit energy, our habitual resisting the unpleasant and clinging to the pleasant, make the decisions for us, we can start to see, oh, perhaps there's a choice there. Can I be curious about that? Um, to see, yeah, maybe there's something I can attend to there. There's wonder and magic with curiosity. Um, have you ever become curious about a, a blade of grass or clouds in the sky? Um, I, I remember being on a vision quest um, experience where I was out in the wilderness for three days fasting. And it was up in the Jefferson Wilderness area. And um, I spent um, most of the day looking at the clouds, watching the cloud formations pass by. It was an incredible meditation. Very, very powerful. There were, um, at some point there stopped being someone who was watching. There was just, yeah, just energy and um, visual stimuli and contours of shadows. And anyway, just incredible experience. Um, such considerations can fill us with wonder and delight at the miracles of nature and fills our hearts with lightness and gratitude and joy to recognize the miracles that are all around us. It doesn't cost anything, um, particularly this time of year when it's so um, pleasant. To, if you live in the Portland area, at least right now, these past few days, to just be present and curious about nature, which is beautiful. Um,
So this process of investigation begins with asking, so what's true right now? Um, and recognizing that in this moment, if we're caught in like a difficult memory from the past, just noticing this gives us space in relationship to the difficulty so that we aren't unconsciously being controlled by it. it changes everything. The second step is to ask, how does this feel in my body and mind? To notice the physical and emotional tensions that are rising and recognizing the resulting contraction. To recognize the dukkha. The third step is to ask, how is my mind reacting to what is happening? Is it fantasizing? Is it creating aversion, bringing up fear? Um, are we clinging to it? Do we have any choice in how to respond as opposed to react to this moment? And perhaps the final step is to ask, what Dharma can I find around this difficult experience for this moment? How might it relate to the Four Noble Truths or the hindrances or the aggregated nature of existence. Is there some aspect of the Dharma that I can bring? All of these are questions, invitations for curiosity, invitations for deepening practice. Um, this is how investigation is a companion with mindfulness. So, um, yeah, just going to pause here for a moment and circle back. So I'm curious if there's any questions, anything that's there or anything that's bubbling up for you that you'd like to share. Here's a quote from Dharma teacher Gil Fronsdale. Bringing interest and investigation to an experience can change our relationship to the experience because it changes the ecology of the mind, so to speak. Investigation brings a wholesome quality to the mind, which can initiate a, a significant shift in the mind when it otherwise is filled with unwholesome or reactive thoughts and emotions. Investigation can, quote, lubricate, unquote, the mind, that is, loosen it up when it's stuck or tight, obsessing about something or feeling constricted. Uh, yeah. So it's stepping, it's uh, in cybernetic theory, it's a second order change. It's stepping out of the state of consciousness that's identified with the, with the difficulty, with the, with the dukkha, um, and being curious about it. Uh, and in that curiosity, there is freedom. That's the key. There's no longer total and complete identification with the contracted state. If I can be curious about it, I can be free from it. That's the key. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Um, so I had a 
student who recently went through a bout of discouragement. So I invited them to investigate the feeling of discouragement in their body, the tightness, the heaviness, the contraction, the darkness. Um, their thoughts were rapid, mind felt tight, sticky, and the investigation helped them to see the stickiness and the attachment. Um, the investigation was very accepting. Um, and the um, invitation was to not try to get rid of the feeling. It was just an invitation to be interested in discovering what the experience was. And um, with practice, the investigation becomes stronger which changed the balance in their mind and started to appreciate the investigation itself, which in turn brought a little more lightness, a little more ease. The stickiness started to dissolve and it was harder for them to remain fixated on their um, bout of discouragement. After seeing the kind of ephemeral nature of their experience on a more nuanced level. Um, since their discouragement was grounded in the stories they were telling themselves, um, as their obsession and thoughts eased, the, the discouragement faded. It changed by itself, itself liberated. They didn't have to get rid of the discouragement they just investigated it and saw that it was made up of non-discouragement pieces. Um, it's not, it wasn't a monolithic thing. Um, so, um, yeah, we can work with that. Being um, one of the things that's helpful with curiosity and investigation is just to notice. So the simple idea of observing what's arising in the mind, is this helpful or wholesome or unhelpful or unwholesome? Um, is this the stuff that keeps us enmeshed in dukkha? Or does it offer support in getting free from dukkha? Does it support letting go of kind of our egotistic tendencies? When we investigate, um, we can see, yeah, does this lead to my own well-being, the well-being of others? Or to the contrary, does this lead to more fear, doubt, anxiety, resentment, pride? Or does this lead to um, compassion and peace, joy, freedom? Um, so that's that curiosity is, I mean, that's part of why uh, investigation curiosity is one of the enlightenment factors because it leads um, to freedom. Since I mentioned the enlightenment factors, I'll just name them. Um, so they're um, mindfulness, energy, joy or rapture, relaxation, tranquility, concentration, equanimity, and investigation. Um, and so in mindfulness and investigation can be kind of active in cultivating those other qualities, recognizing whether they're present or not, strengthening them. Yeah. And we can also be curious when we do cultivation practices like metta, for example, loving kindness practice, um, does it make a difference? Um, does 
planting the seeds of loving kindness with loving intention on a regular basis do anything? Does it change? My experience with it has been when I regularly practice heart cultivation, um, my outlook changes in a positive direction and um, it tends to arise more spontaneously, unbidden. The same is true with mindfulness. I practice on a daily basis, then it shows up spontaneously in um, you know, various places in my life where it's beneficial. So um, being curious about, does this stuff work really? Does this lead to my own welfare and well-being and does it help others? Um, those are important questions. So the Buddha said, don't take his word for it. Don't take my word for it. Trust yourself. Be curious. Discover for yourself what's true. Um, so that's the invitation with curiosity and investigation. And so um, the uh, hopeful and positive kind of um, foundation of this practice is that we all have the capacity to be more um, loving, peaceful, happy, and with curiosity investigation, we can sort through our complex lives and distinguish what helps this capacity grow. And um, we, if we place a high enough priority on these qualities and make room for the practices, then um, curiosity can help us separate the chaff from the wheat. Um, yeah, and that's really what we're doing is what's really helpful, what's beneficial. The Buddha gave us a roadmap to, as a starting point, to make those distinctions, but then we have to actually put it into practice ourselves. So um, the, this talk I'm giving this evening is going to dovetail with uh, my teaching on Sunday. I'm going to be teaching this Sunday um, meditation. And so um, hope you can join me there. And uh, so this Sunday, we're going to be focusing on um, skillful effort in meditation. And it goes right along with what we're talking about this evening. So there's that. So it's about time for us to transition into wrapping things up and doing our closing. Any last sharing or questions before we close? Well, let's, um, let's just bring our focus um, to um, curiosity about what would be beneficial for heart cultivation this evening. Yeah. What, what does your heart and mind and body long to hear? What would bring balance? What would bring peace? What would bring acceptance? And it's okay if you don't know for sure. You can um, be experimental and try something and see. And then be curious about what the results are. Stay connected to your body. And there could be a simple, yeah, intention like, yeah, may I be free from fear. May I abide in well-being. May I learn to accept myself when I make mistakes. Those are just a few of simple examples. Yeah, so what's alive for you?
the same ones. Yeah, cupping up and then giving it some um, attention and perhaps repeating, repeating your wish for yourself, letting it radiate throughout your being, noticing how it feels in the body. Is there any resistance or pushback? Or perhaps there's a sense of warmth and openness. If there's any resistance, maybe you can be curious about that and allow it to soften. And, yeah, to check in and see if there's a willingness to expand um, our heart uh, intention to include our community virtually gathered here this evening on uh, Zoom and Facebook, yeah, sharing our wishes of well-being, yeah, wishing for uh, our Sangha, our community, yeah, may you find the fruits, uh, the wonderful benefits that come from curiosity, from stepping out of the habitual conditioning into the space of possibility, of opening, and to extend our wishes out beyond our virtual circle this evening, out yeah, to those who are near and dear to us, our, our family, our loved ones, wishing um, those who are struggling, wishing them freedom. May they find a way to step out of identification with things that cause suffering and find freedom and peace and extending our wishes out in all directions. And we can make it um, directional to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, to include all beings without distinction. beings of the air, land, waters. Yeah, may all beings be freed from all forms of suffering. And to close with our simple chant, may all beings be happy. And um, we can do that three times. And then sadhu three times. You're welcome to unmute and join me as we do that. Send our wishes out. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Um, my friends, please um, go in peace, take what's ever beneficial and put it into practice if you can. Anything that's not, just let it go. I mean, take the good stuff. And um, yeah, hope to see you again next week if you can join me in person. Love to see you. And um, you're welcome to join on Zoom as well. Take care. Have a good week. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Welcome. Nice. Bye. Bye. Bye.